neurotransmitters exert their effects on their target cells by binding to receptors. There's two broad classes of neurotransmitter receptors. There's going to be our ionotropic receptors that create uh, fast ion currents by directly opening up a channel within the receptor itself. That's going to be the main focus of today. The second option would be metabotropic receptors or G protein coupled receptors. I'll introduce those right at the end. We're going to spend a lot more time on those in the next lecture. So these are going to create those fast and slow components of uh, synaptic events. We'll talk about the general structure of ionotropic receptors and then we'll go through our uh, most common uh, ionotropic receptors. At the end we'll introduce GPCRs and then we'll talk a lot more about those next time. So your ionotropic receptors, if they're going to function properly, you need to have a pore for ions to move through. They need to have some sort of ligand binding domain. That's going to be their activation gate. And they need a selectivity filter. So we've already talked about these uh, in this class, so those are all still the same thing. So without an ion pore, no ion movement, no current, no effect. <clears throat> the selectivity filter is still what's going to determine what ions move through and different Receptors will have different selectivity filters, making them either excitatory or inhibitory. And they'll have different ligand binding domains, causing them to bind different neurotransmitters. All neurotransmitter receptors are going to show some degree of receptor desensitization as well. Some will do it more rapidly than others, but they will all desensitize to some degree. And what desensitization uh, looks like would be a decrease in the amplitude of a current despite the presence of the ligand. Now at the, that's pretty terrible. At the single channel level, what that's going to equate to is a decrease in open probability and time. So with desensitization, the pore is not as likely to be open, and when it opens, it's not open quite as long. So the current is going to be maximal at the beginning, and then we'll see desensitization. Some will be rapid, others slower. But they will all desensitize to some degree. And they're all going to have scaffolding proteins to hold them in place. This is what keeps them at the synapse. Different neurotransmitter receptors will have different scaffolding proteins and they'll all be linked to the postsynaptic density. And that's just the collection of cytoskeletal proteins, adapter proteins, and scaffolding proteins that are going to help hold the neurotransmitter receptors immediately opposed to the presynaptic site. So all of our receptors are going to have this in common, but there will be some slight differences between them. We're also going to find that the second transmembrane domain of each subunit is going to form the ion pore. Now this is a little different from our voltage-gated channels, where it's the fifth and sixth. In this case, we really just have four transmembrane domains that we're working with. We're going to see different numbers of subunits coming together to form different uh, neurotransmitter receptors. So we have, in some cases, five. That would be our acetylcholine receptors, GABA, glycine. It would be four for uh, glutamate receptors and, and three for uh, ATP or pure energetic receptors. But in each case, all of those subunits are going to have four transmembrane domains, except for P2X, those will be dimers. Uh, but all the others that we'll talk about today, four transmembrane domains, and the second one forms the pore. So this is just showing you the um, actual structure uh, of um, our uh, uh, ligand gated ion channel there. So you can see that there's in part A, that's just a schematic showing you the extracellular ligand binding domain as well as the four transmembrane domains. And these are going to come together uh, to form the, the functional acetylcholine receptor. So whenever we have ligand binding, that pore is going to uh, open up there. So in this case, we have a pentamer coming together, and so the second transmembrane domain from all five subunits are going to orient toward the center to create the pore. 
Now with ligand binding, we're going to open up the pore really in one of two ways. <clears throat> we can actually just pull the second transmembrane domains apart from one another. That's what's going to happen with inotropic glutamate receptors. So there's uh, the ligand binding domain, which is going to be created by really two strings of amino acids that come together. There's the S1 and S2 uh, that come together to form the S1, S2 domain. So these are just two different strings, either between the uh, N terminus and the first transmembrane domain, that's S1, and the S2 is between the third and fourth transmembrane domain. So if we have our membrane here, We'll have our N terminus, and then we have one, two, uh, sorry, we loop back for glutamate receptors. So that second one is what we call a recurrent loop. So this is transmembrane domain one, two, three, four. S1, S2. So the way that these actually fold up by kind of folding together to create a binding site for the ligand. And it's shown much better in that cartoon there. When glutamate binds, or in the case of this cartoon, it looks like maybe canate, yeah. Either way, when the ligand binds, that's going to uh, cause, you can see here, that's going to cause the movement of the second transmembrane domains away from each other. So there's usually going to be uh, two ligand binding domains and when they each bind their ligand they kind of snap shut pulling the second transmembrane domain open. In other cases we're going to see opening occur because of rotation. So for uh, the pentameric neurotransmitter receptors such as nicotinic acetylcholine receptors when the ligand binds to the extracellular ligand binding domain, that causes rotation. So, think of the ion pore as being, don't need to do the hand jive here, kind of a bent structure that essentially is closed. Whenever the ligand binds, these will rotate out of the way to open up, kind of like an aperture. So we open up our ion pore, that's going to do a couple of things. It's going to remove hydrophobic residues that were sitting here. So we, we orient hydrophobic residues toward the center when we're closed. We rotate them out of the way and we put polar amino acids toward the pore. So we remove hydrophobic and we expose hydrophilic amino acids so that water soluble compounds like ions can move through. Now which ions move through depends on the selectivity filter. So in the ion pore or at extracellular sites we have a selectivity filter. And there could be multiple rings of amino acids but in the end the selectivity is going to be determined by charged amino acids. And if you have positively charged amino acids you'll let negatively charged ions move through and you'll repel the positively charged ions. Conversely, if you're a cation channel, which most of these we're talking about today are, you're going to have negatively charged amino acids. That's going to repel anions and attract cations into the pore. So those are the basic features. Let's look at some specific examples. We're going to start off with our pentameric ionotropic receptors, which is going to uh, constitute the bulk of our, neurotrans or our ionotropic neurotransmitter receptors. So we got our nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, GAB receptors, glycine receptors. So here's a tree showing you uh, different neurotransmitter receptors. So you have your trimeric uh, P2X receptors, kind of right there, circled in pink. Off to the right, there's your tetrameric glutamate receptors. That's going to give us our fast excitation. And then on the kind of left and upper part, circled in green, we have our pentameric family. We have uh, some serotonergic receptors here, which we won't discuss today. We have ad, um, um, cholinergic receptors. Uh, we have glycinergic and gabaergic receptors as well. So in order to make a functional receptor, we're going to have five subunits in this case. Each one, again, four transmembrane uh, domains. We're going to use the second to form our pore. So we're dealing with five subunits here. That's what this 
family is going to contain. Now for each subunit we have options as far as what we contain. So for all of the receptors that we talk about there are multiple different versions for each subunit. So for uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors for example, there's a few different types out there. Uh, so you can have alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon. And for each of those there's going to be different types of alpha. For example, there's not just one alpha subunit. Uh, there can be multiple versions of alpha, but you got to have an alpha subunit. In fact, some only contain five copies of alpha subunits. you got to have the alpha subunit because that has your ligand binding site. So without alpha subunits, you're not an acetylcholine receptor. So we're always going to see alpha. And in the central nervous system, that might be all you see. There might be a little bit of beta as well. If you're an eel and you have an electric organ, you can see the subunit composition there. We're not eels, uh, but we do have nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in our neuromuscular junction. You can see the receptor makeup there. So we got, we got alpha in there, but there's a mix. There's some beta, we see some delta and epsilon. So depending on the receptor uh, subunits that you have, that's going to determine which drugs bind, how long do you stay open. But in the end, they're all going to be the same. They're going to bind nicotine. I'm sorry, they will bind nicotine. They're going to bind acetylcholine. That will open them up, and they're going to be non-specific cation channels. And the reason that they're non-specific cation channels is because of their selectivity filter. So we're still going to open up by rotation. That's what that cartoon is showing us. And when we rotate, we're going to open up the pore. Now, what we're going to allow to move through are just any old cation. It could be sodium, potassium, calcium, doesn't matter. As long as you have a positive charge, you can move through because we have three rings of negatively charged amino acids. Those are shown in red in this uh, schematic here. So when you look at the crystal structure of your nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, you'll see, of course, five subunits, and there's going to be three distinct rings of negatively charged amino acids pointed toward the center. There's your selectivity filter comes in three parts. And what that does is only allow cations to move through. Now in neurons that only have those alpha subunits, you're going to find these mostly presynaptically and they're going to facilitate neurotransmitter release. You don't find them quite as much postsynaptically. A little more uh, presynaptic in this case. You'll definitely find them postsynaptically out there in the periphery at the neuromuscular junction. <clears throat> There are, of course, some differences in, in their makeup, and so they're going to have slightly different ion permeabilities, but they're all going to be nonspecific cation channels. You see a little more calcium flux in neurons, and that makes sense because you find them presynaptically. And we don't really care as much about depolarization. We care a lot more about how much calcium are we bringing in. Now, there are going to be several drugs that act on this receptor. We're going to go through drugs for all of our receptors here. Uh, nicotine. Uh, is an obvious drug that will affect nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So you can see the effects of nicotine on, with the data on the left. When you apply nicotine, you're going to see the, the inward current that then desensitizes. If you antagonize nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, nicotine does nothing. There are a number of toxins that are going to act on nicotinic acetylcholine receptors because that's going to prevent movement. If you either uh, block the binding of nicotine or you block the pore. So we'll use alpha bungrotoxin in the lab to label nicotinic acetylcholine receptors because it'll bind to the acetylcholine binding site. <clears throat> um, venomous snakes are going to use it to paralyze their prey because the alpha bungrotoxin binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, prevents acetylcholine from binding, and now uh, the little rodent can't run away. So it makes mealtime a little uh, more convenient. And we can see the effect of alpha bungrotoxin with the data on the right. Um, it's going to provide a little more long-lived um, inhibition, as we can see here, compared to the other toxin there, MLA. But what they're measuring uh, would be the, uh, the currents measured through their nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So when you apply the toxin, no more current, no more movement.
Nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are going to be held in place by scaffolding proteins and they appear to be a little different depending on whether you're at the neuromuscular junction or uh, whether you're in the central nervous system. And that's probably because you see them a little more presynaptic uh, than, than postsynaptic in the central nervous system. So we expect different proteins. We know quite a bit about the neuromuscular junction. Um, so the scaffolding protein wraps in is going to bind to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and then hold it onto this big complex that's going to be connected to the actin cytoskeleton. So uh, the, the protein that wraps and binds to is going to be dystrophin. Dystrophin and other scaffolding proteins then link to the cytoskeleton to hold our nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in place. Now the reason why we use so many different proteins to hold neurotransmitter receptors in place is that it gives us a little bit of flexibility so we can help move them around. In the central nervous system, it's, it's not rapsin. We think it's probably using PDZ uh, uh, binding proteins. So we'll talk about those with glutamate receptors. So we think it's a little more similar to that. We're still working that out. For GABA receptors, and we're going to switch gears a bit here. Now it's inhibition. Still, it's going to be a pentamer uh, in this case. Uh, there's, there's going to be a variety of subunits, just like in nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Uh, most commonly, we're going to see alpha, uh, two, two alpha, two beta, and a gamma. But there are other uh, possible subunits that we'll see, and depending on the subunits, that'll determine the kinetics and the binding of different drugs. We're going to need to see alpha and beta subunits, though, together because the binding site for GABA is going to be between those. Different drugs will bind uh, at, at different uh, binding sites. Uh, for example, uh, benzodiazepines uh, can bind between the alpha and um, gamma subunits. So depending on your receptor makeup, that will determine what drugs can bind. But you're going to see alpha and you're going to see beta, because without those two, we don't have a GABA binding site. So if, you're, if you just contain alpha and beta, when you bind GABA, you can create a current. You can see that here on the left. A different makeup that includes gamma subunits, we see uh, a stronger current generated with the same dose of GABA. Uh, so you see slightly different uh, kinetics of opening and probabilities of opening based on the receptor makeup. Regardless of that, when GABA receptors open, they are going to create uh, inhibitory currents because they are chloride channels. Their selectivity filter is made up of positively charged amino acids. So there's a few different sites where they have positively charged amino acids and that's going to help determine um, the ions that can move through. So in this case, chloride. Any positively charged ion is going to get repelled. GABA A receptors uh, are going to be inhibitory because of a little bit of hyperpolarization that might happen, uh, but that hyperpolarization isn't going to do a whole lot. The big point here is shunting inhibition, so we're going to resist depolarization. That's the big idea. <clears throat> so if we were to cause some mutations in the GABA uh, receptor there, and we're going to take that, that proline and convert it either into the negatively charged uh, glutamic acid or positively charged arginine, we're going to see different effects. So right now, think about what you would expect to have happen if we were to, let's say, stick a negatively charged amino acid into the pore, very close to the selectivity filter. And what might happen if we stick a positively charged amino acid in there? And hopefully what you're imagining is that adding the positively charged amino acid is going to increase the current. So if you look at the, the filled circles here, that's your regular old run-of-the-mill current that you get from applying GABA to this receptor. When you apply GABA, you're going to get a current. And the amount of current depends on how easy it is for the ions to move through. It's going to be a lot more difficult for anions to move through if we start to take, if we stick negatively charged amino acids in, like that glutamic acid. So at the same dose, let's say the one a micromolar dose of GABA, you'll notice a decrease in current whenever we substitute in that 
negatively charged amino acid because it's going to repel. If we put in a positively charged amino acid, so that arginine, well now we get an even greater current. So it's all about having amino acids in your selectivity filter that are the opposite charge of the ion you want to move. We're going to have different drugs, of course, that act on GABA-A receptors, um, and these are commonly used to relieve anxiety or uh, just celebrate uh, the weekend um, or kill pain. Uh, those are also used for this too. So uh, benzodiazepines and barbiturates, these are going to increase the frequency of channel opening and prolong the open time, respectively. Ethanol seems to do both of those things. So on top you can see the, the, the current that we get from applying a couple doses of GABA. Then GABA is co-applied with the uh, uh, benzodiazepine and you see a much larger GABA current as a result. So GABA-A receptors uh, are the ionotropic receptors that we're dealing with here. And they're going to be potentiated by benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and ethanol. There are also, of course, antagonists that are either going to block the pore or block the binding site. Picrotoxin, we think, sticks in the pore because there's a few different mutations that you can see on the bottom that interfere with picrotoxin binding, and all of those mutations occur in the ion pore. Bicuculin is going to bind to the GABA binding site and block GABA binding. We, of course, have to hold our GABA receptors in place, and that's going to be accomplished with scaffolding proteins. In this case, uh, the protein Jeferin is going to bind to GABA receptors and then link that uh, via profilin to the actin cytoskeleton. Moving on to our glutamate receptors, now we're into our tetrameric complex here. So for our ionotropic glutamate receptors, uh, we got a few different types. I'm going to break it down really into two. Uh, it's still the case that we have four transmembrane domains. That second one makes that reentrant loop and, and forms the pore. <clears throat> so we've gone through this already. Now there's two types. There's the NMDA and non-NMDA. NMDA is going to have a magnesium block and have thus voltage dependence, while the non-NMDA, which includes AMPA and kinate type, don't have that. So if their ligand binds, they open up, they give you a current, and they'll rapidly desensitize. Um, the NMDA receptors require a bit of depolarization beforehand before they can relieve the magnesium block and conduct ions. There's a little bit of difference in how they're linked to the cytoskeleton. There's direct linkage for NMDA receptors, making them a little more stable, and we have an intermediate uh, scaffolding protein that's going to bind to uh, non-NMDA receptors. So the AMP receptors are going to be a little more flexible. We can, we can add those and remove those from the synapse because we have an extra step of regulation. <clears throat> the AMPA and kinate receptors are, for the most part, non-specific cation channels. Um, these are going to be uh, made of different subunits, glue A for AMPA, glue K for uh, kinate, now, AMPA receptors are the ones that we're going to talk about a lot more. Usually, kinate receptors are brushed under the rug, and we're going to do that again. Depending on the subunit composition, that's going to help determine the ion selectivity. And the, the neat thing about AMPA receptors is that the, uh, the arginine residue that makes glue A2 subunits calcium impermeable is not actually encoded in the DNA. Uh, it requires RNA editing to turn that glycine into an arginine. So without RNA editing, AMPA receptors would all be completely calcium permeable. But the glue A2 containing subunits have RNA editing take place that sticks in an arginine and that interferes with calcium permeability. So they become calcium impermeable and that's what the data on the left are showing us. Glue A used to be called glue R. So glue R1 containing subunits are, are going to be nonspecific cation channels. Um, so whether there's normal ringers that has all kinds of ions or just a ringer solution that only has calcium, when you compare that to the glue A2 containing subunits on the right, well that calcium containing ringers that has no other uh, ions in it doesn't create any sort of current. We're going to link our ionotropic glutamate receptors to the postsynaptic density. Uh, we're going to have an intermediate protein uh, called TARPS 
uh, that will bind to AMPA receptors and link them to the postsynaptic density. In both cases, we're going to be using uh, PDZ domains. Uh, so PDZ domains bind to each other. So the glutamate receptors have PDZ domains. Um, the, the PSD95 uh, structural protein of the postsynaptic density has PDZ domains, so they stick. Um, but for AMPA receptors, we're going to have an intermediate there uh, called stargazing that's going to bind to the AMPA receptor and give it its PDZ domain. PSD95 is then going to be linked to the cytoskeleton by a variety of proteins. And again, we're using a bunch of proteins because it gives us multiple sites of regulation. AMPA receptors are particularly flexible because they don't have uh, that, that PDZ domain. They're instead going to uh, use stargazing to be linked to the postsynaptic density. Now, the NMDA receptors are a little neat because they have not only ligand dependence, but voltage dependence. We need to see two subunits that are, that are required for NMDA receptors. That's GLU-N1 and GLU-N2. GLU-N1 is required to form the pore. GLU-N2 is going to create the glutamate binding site. So you've got to have those. Now, that magnesium that sits in the pore is going to give... Uh, NMDA receptors, their characteristic J-shaped IV curve. So when you're at resting potentials, you don't get much of a current. It requires some depolarization to see that inward current. So that's why your AMP receptors will give you that linear IV relationship, whereas NMDA receptors have that J shape, and that's because we have our magnesium block preventing inward currents until we depolarize and spit out that magnesium. Uh, NMDA receptors are going to be uh, a lot more permeable to uh, calcium than AMPA receptors. So NMDA receptors are going to create a much larger calcium influx. That calcium is going to act as a secondary messenger and affect intracellular signaling pathways. We think that this uh, calcium permeability is due to an asparagine residue uh, on transmembrane uh, domain number two. So whenever we mutate that, calcium permeability drops uh, relative to other ions. So if you compare the top normal to the bottom with the mutation, you'll notice a big difference between uh, our sodium and calcium permeability. So we're relatively impermeable uh, to calcium in the bottom. And the NMDA receptor compared to AMP receptors desensitizes far slower. So we're going to see a much longer-lived current that's going to have a lot of calcium in it. <clears throat> Different drugs are going to affect uh, NMDA receptors, and these are going to have hallucinogenic uh, effects. So uh, PCP, MK801, these are going to bind within the pore um, after the NMDA receptors are blocked. Uh, AP5 and AP7 are, are commonly used drugs in the lab that will bind at the glutamate binding site and prevent activation of the receptor. Just a bit on G-protein coupled receptors. We're going to have more on this in the, less le in, in the next lecture, but I want to introduce them because they, they create that late component of uh, the synaptic uh, event. So GPCRs, or G-protein coupled receptors, have seven transmembrane domains. There's a ligand binding site usually buried in the membrane uh, within that receptor itself. Sometimes it's extracellular. That's what we see with metabotropic glutamate receptors. When the ligand binds, this then leads to activation of G-proteins. The G in this case means that they bind uh, guanine nucleotides. So they stick to that third intracellular loop connecting the 5th and 6th transmembrane domains. When the neurotransmitter binds, that stimulates the addition of GTP onto the G protein. So GTP is going to activate it. The G protein is going to turn itself off through hydrolysis of GTP. So the receptor upon neurotransmitter binding is going to stick GTP onto our G protein. which has alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. When it's bound with GTP, the alpha subunit can float around and do stuff. It'll spontaneously degrade that GTP 
back to GDP, and that inactivates it. So it's going to break off that terminal phosphate group there. G proteins are made of our alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. Beta and gamma act together as the beta-gamma complex up at the membrane. Alpha is going to be the intracellular soluble portion, and there can be different types of alpha subunits, which we'll talk about next lecture. When bound with GDP, they're going to stick at the receptor and not do anything. After a neurotransmitter binds, the receptor sticks GTP onto the G protein, breaking apart the alpha subunit and letting it float about the cell. This will spontaneously turn itself off and return back to the membrane. Now, when the neurotransmitter binds, we're not just stimulating one G protein, we're going to stimulate multiple G proteins. So as long as the neurotransmitter is bound there, uh, the, the receptor can slap GTP onto multiple G proteins and activate them. This is uh, what we call collision coupling, so whenever a G protein bumps into it that's inactive, it'll get turned on so long as the neurotransmitter is bound. Now, of course, we have regulation here, just like we do with ionotropic receptors, so we'll see some form of desensitization as well. In this case, we're going to see a rapid form where um, usually the G protein coupled receptor leads to the activation of a kinase that phosphorylates it and interferes with G protein binding. That's the example given here. So when we activate the receptor, it then stimulates a kinase that inactivates the receptor. This way we have a brief period of time where we have the activation of the signal and then it terminates so it doesn't become noise. The slower mechanism of regulation is actual endocytosis of the receptor, so removing it from the surface so it can no longer bind its ligand and do anything. If we continue to have activation, of uh, the receptors that are there, we're going to target our receptors for degradation. So we might recycle them back, we might destroy them, it depends on how prolonged that signal is activated. So all good things have to come to an end, uh, including this. If something came up as tricky, fill it out in the questions box so we can uh, talk about that in class. I'll see you later.